on public safety and criminal justice reform for the 92nd state legislative session will come to order and the clerk will take the roll. Chair Mariani. Present. Vice Chair Fraser. Present. Lee Johnson. Present. Representative Edelson. Present. Representative Feist. Present. Representative Grossel. Present. Representative Hollins. Present. Representative Hewitt. Present. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn, present. Representative Long. Present. Representative Lucero. Lucero, present. Representative Mueller. Mueller, present. Representative Novotny. Novotny, present. Representative O'Neill. O'Neill, present. Representative Pinto. Present. Representative Poston. Present. Representative Raleigh. Raleigh, present. Representative Vang. Present. Representative Shung. Representative Shung. That concludes roll call chair, a quorum is present. Very well, quorum is present. This hearing is conducted under Minnesota House Rule 10.01, allowing for hearings to be held via use of distance learning, remote electronic voting, or voting by other means to protect the health, safe, and safety of the public, staff, and members. This hearing is live streamed on the House website and can be accessed via the committee's page on that website. And those wishing to offer public testimony can contact the committee administrator, Mr. Jamal uh, Lundy, Lundy, via email 24 hours prior to a hearing, uh, that address is also available on our committee page on the House website. Um, members, uh, we've got uh, three bills uh, that the chair wishes uh, us to hear um, today. Um, uh, but I also want to share uh, with uh, all members the process that the and the timeline that the chair will be um, uh, using. Uh, as we enter into our um, our third committee deadline um, next week. Um, and so, uh, so everyone's aware, um, our the chair's plan is to uh, post a, um, a DE uh, that will serve as our omnibus, uh, uh, framework for omnibus bill uh, by Sunday of, of this weekend. So all members uh, should be uh, able to uh, view that by Sunday. If it's possible, I'll try to get that up on Saturday and give you as much time uh, as possible. Uh, but uh, my goal is to have that on Sunday. And then on Tuesday, uh, we'll begin our process. We do have a bill um, that I'll be bringing uh, forward um, that will um, address uh, the potential um, recommendations from the uh, Wilder um, uh, external review uh, report that we'll be hearing later this week. Um, this is a review of the state response to last summer's civil unrest uh, issues. Um, there may well be recommendations that come forward uh, from that. Um, the purview of the state patrol um, does not lie um, mostly or mostly in this committee. Um, it's uh, really a jurisdiction of our transportation committee. So it would be my goal uh, to forward um, our recommendations to that committee as they, they then exercise their appropriate oversight uh, of uh, state patrol issues uh, that may or may not be raised by the Wilder uh, report. Um, so then uh, after uh, that bill, then we'll begin uh, the omnibus process. I'll present um, uh, the DE uh, bill will walk through the different bills that the chair um, has uh, will be folding into uh, the DE. Um, and so we'll work to have an understanding and a layout uh, of the bill for all members. Uh, then, of course, you know, we'll enter into a market process uh, during the week. Uh, our amendment deadline will be 2 p.m. on Wednesday. Uh, so Tuesday, we're doing a walkthrough. On Wednesday, we'll have a um, Amendment deadline at 2 p.m. We will uh, proceed in a manner where we will have amendments to amendments if uh, committee members so desire. And that deadline will be 7 p.m. Uh, on Wednesday. Uh, on Thursday, uh, we have a four hour block of time, 
so this is, uh, we're not the only ones. Uh, this is how our finance committees are moving uh, forward to make sure we get to work on time. So we'll begin at our regular time at 1 p.m. on uh, Thursday. We'll finish at 5.30, um, or that's our goal. Um, and uh, we'll uh, have testimony on the DE uh, to, um, um, of the omnibus, um, and then we'll begin the amendment uh, process. Uh, if we're not done with the amendment process um, on Thursday, then we will meet uh, on Friday. Uh, we will meet at 8.30 uh, a.m., so the idea is to get our work done uh, in the morning. Um, and again, roughly a four hour uh, period of time uh, while where we will conclude with our amendments um, and then uh, take action uh, on the omnibus bill. So let me just pause really quickly. I'll make sure this is all uh, in writing. I think this is in our annotated uh, agenda that our committee member provides. If not, I'll make sure that you all have this uh, in writing so you're clear about the timelines. Um, let me just stop to see if there are any questions or, uh, Lee Johnson, yes. Uh, Chairman Mariani, you talked about Thursday starting at one and getting done between five and five 30. Are we going to be recessing for session? Cause it's, uh, we have session at, uh, three 30 that day. I believe so. Um, um, I believe so. Um, the point is that we, uh, we'll have, hopefully, we'll have, uh, you know, uh, plenty of time to act on, if not all the amendments, most, but if need to, um, uh, yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Very well. All right, members, uh, Representative Fraser, can you move the minutes of March 24th? So moved, Chair. Very well. The minutes of March 24th are uh, before us. Voice uh, vote is fine. Very well, thank you. Uh, if there's no discussion, all in favor of adopting the minutes of March 24th, please say aye. 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 The poll is same sign. Motion prevails, and the minutes of March 24th are hereby adopted. The first uh, bill up today is House File 4397 uh, by Representative Pinto. Um, Representative Pinto, uh, we will be bringing this bill up uh, for possible inclusion uh, in the omnibus bill. Um, and so our motion, that's our uh, motion before us. And so your bill is before us, Representative Pinto. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thanks, members. Um, House File 4397 uh, has, is, um, contains a series of provisions that are directed at uh, youth justice um, and at uh, juvenile justice. Um, we've had, obviously, a lot of attention on that issue in our communities. Um, and uh, uh, it seemed to me that, that now is a time for us to um, take great strides. I guess I'll, I'll note that with um, the forecasted budget surplus, um, we know that there are tremendous needs um, in our state, um, and we have resources that, um, that should be applied to meet those needs. And boy, I could not think of a higher need than making sure that young people are on a path that is um, good for them and good for their health and good for their lives and a way um, where that is not um, causing problems for the rest of us, um, which is where, you, uh, where youth justice intersects. Um, so the bill contains um, a series of ideas um, that uh, uh, were brought most immediately to me by our testifier, who's Kate Rickman. Um, I uh, had um, the good fortune to have um, Ms. Rickman as my boss for a while, the Ramsey County Attorney's Office, deep expertise in, uh, in juvenile justice. And as you'll see, uh, if you look at the bill, it's, it's pretty darn short. Um, there are a series of grants uh, for mental health services for uh, youth development. Um, it says after school programming in the, in the, the title, but um, uh, mentoring, uh, community engagement, um, uh, a, an assessment tool to make sure that a juvenile justice and mental health systems um, are, are set up well to support young people, um, training for staff in juvenile detention facilities to make sure that they are trained in mental health, health crisis response, trauma-informed care, and jumping back up to the sub, subdivision. Um, well, subdivision one are, are in, uh, generally uh, encompassing all these areas. You'll see that there are some dollar amounts. There are also some blank appropriations, some places where um, we're uh, uh, receiving a fiscal note to get a direction about how much that training would, for example, cost. Um, but I really want to emphasize um, to members that 
um, we need to take um, a very comprehensive approach to juvenile justice. Um, and uh, it seems to me that the, the ideas that are contained here um, do so. So I'll maybe have a little more to say, Mr. Chair, but if I can, I'd like to ask um, Ms. Rickman to testify now to talk kind of about what we're gonna get um, with the money that we'd be spending uh, on, this, uh, on this bill. Very well, Ms. Rickman, uh, welcome to the committee. Please, please state your name for the record and uh, provide us with your testimony. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. My name is Kate Richtman, R-I-C-H-T-M-A-N. And um, thank you, Representative Pinto, for the opportunity to speak. I would say that while he claims that I um, supervised him while I was in the Ramsey County Attorney's Office, I, I venture to say really honestly, I don't know that anyone ever really supervises Dave. He is a, a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> um, but I, I did spend... Um, 28 years in the Ramsey County Attorney's Office and 25 of them were managing the juvenile division in that office, um, prosecuting very serious cases as well as really leading the, the effort to improve our diversionary responses and also developing and implementing uh, programming for truant youth and youth who are running away sexually exploited, uh, sexually trafficked youth. And so that specific assignment or that specific work really blended the child welfare work that I that I deeply involved in at that time and continue to be involved in and the delinquency component. So I really feel like I have this, um, I see things from so many sides because of that work and I'm, I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, as the representatives, uh, Representative Pinto said, Mental health services, and that's the first sub, sub, substantive subdivision of this bill, is probably the most critical and overarching need within the, within the juvenile justice system. Mental health services for youth referred to the, the juvenile justice system especially needed our crisis and stabilization services, as well as comprehensive mental health screening. Um, emerging mental health issues often involve acting out or aggressive behaviors. Too often that results in referral to the delinquency system as the only system that is required to provide services. Mandatory children's mental health services will assist the juvenile justice system with proper assessment and appropriate treatment to avoid the youth becoming even more deeply involved in the juvenile justice system. I would call your attention to um, the work done by the office, the Federal Office of Justice Programming, the National Center for Mental Health and Juvenile Justice reports that youth who immediately receive a mental health screening are more likely to have their problems identified and appropriately treated. In addition, necessary mental health as well as behavioral health services really, I have seen significantly reduce the, the risk that the child is going to re-enter the system through a re-offense. So what's needed, what, what's within that mental health world, what really is critical? Um, I would say, especially in the landscape that we see today for juvenile justice, uh, youth coming into juvenile justice system, um, all too often it is the child's unmet mental health or behavioral health needs that result in involvement. Funding that's specifically targeted for things like residential care and community-based programming, as well as school-based programming is critically needed. They can be targeted in any way this, this committee or the legislature determines to be appropriate, but I would recommend that, they're, that the targeting, the funding be targeted for sites within the, um, the state that are experiencing higher levels of delinquency and have those models, those services be co-designed within that community with people who have lived the experience as well as the experts and providers for, um, for those services. And that would include folks within the corrections, juvenile justice correction system, who are working with the youth while they're on probation. Um, the next provision, the after school programming, um, mentoring and tutoring and community engagement activities are critical for youth to keep them out of the system. So as a prevention tool, as an intervention tool, and also as a harm reduction tool. Um, what we know and what we've learned, I've learned through being educated by the experts in this field is that one significant person in their lives, um, one activity in their lives that is a positive 
youth development activity can change, change a child's trajectory in ways that we really can't fathom. Um, it can truly make all of the difference in the world for a child. And I would, I would note that, especially with the emerging research on trauma and trauma-informed therapy, combining that as a component to the type of interventions that are provided has had tremendous results. There's also tremendously positive research on things like the, the work around hope and building hope and resiliency within children. And that can be combined with this after school programming. The assessment tool that is in this bill, the mental health assessment, um, would include a continuum of care model that's specially designed for a juvenile justice population. Right now, juvenile justice practitioners are, are simply reacting and responding to the needs of the youth, constantly changing their approach. And so with where we are at right now, I really believe that now is the time to engage in strategizing around the ways that we can do a better job with mental health crises, um, funding to create this tool for use within the juvenile justice system can really help streamline services, but also avoid duplication of services. And where I really ran into issues was conflicting assessments and an assessment that said one thing and then an assessment that said the other and not having it be a comprehensive approach. Um, the final, and, and I, mm -hmm. I, with all due respect, uh, Chair, there is a hand up. What would you like me to do? Do at this point? Do you want me to pause or and answer questions, or should I simply finish my comments and then you call on the, the committee? I'm looking to you for guidance here. I have just one more point to make. I think you're fine. Uh, okay. Yeah, All right. Absolutely. All right. Um, the the comprehensive facility-wide trauma-informed care training is something that has it's in the it's happened in one detention facility in Minnesota through funding that was provided through the Juvenile Justice Advisory Committee. And if we can take that training statewide for all detention facilities, and there are 12 facilities around the state, it helps staff understand what's going on when there is a mental health crisis within, a child is experiencing a mental health crisis. And no matter what that staff person's role is, whether it's the person who's serving lunch or it's the person who's providing therapy, um, for them to have the capacity to recognize, recognize and triage mental health crisis situations in within the juvenile detention centers can help us de-escalate situations before they become serious, but also provide the needed that child the needed services they need to stabilize, to be safe for them, and to, to have safety within the facility. I also, while it is not in this bill, um, would be happy to talk about crossover and dual, the dual status youth. Um, model that is being proposed, but I think I would pause here because this is simply about this bill. And but I'm happy to answer questions about that proposal as well. Um, Very well, thank you, Ms. Rickman. Um, Chair Pinto, um, there are some questions here, but let me turn to you first to see if there's anything you wanted to add. Thank you so much, Rickman's uh, presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, and I'll, I'll note as we transition to questions is just that uh, the, this set of provisions are, as you can probably tell from my introductory comments, that they're really intended to be part of a broader push towards addressing needs in youth justice. Um, I've been working really closely with Representative Feist, and um, there's a couple other bills that I direct members' attention to, and Ms. Rickman had cited one of them, um, House File 3732, which relates to crossover and dual status youth, which is in the governor's budget. So we heard that last week. One reason I didn't push to hear it today, and Representative Feist has a bill too, and we should probably talk about that. But just to say, um, this is a real opportunity for us, and I'm eager to have a conversation uh, today. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Chair, ready for that. Yeah, very well. Um, you know, let me let me begin with uh, Representative Feist, and I'll go over to Representative Mueller, just because um, um, you referenced her, and I, I do know that uh, she has been uh, working uh, closely with you on shaping this bill to see if there's anything she wants to add and or comments or questions. Uh, Representative Feist. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yes, just to echo Representative Pinto, we've been working together to really look at uh, the proliferation of bills around these issues that have been introduced in recent weeks, um, including um, a bill that I introduced, um, House File 4190, um, which uh, talks about a lot of the investments that Ms. Rickman was kind of framing around intervention, prevention, 
um, and mental health and harm reduction. And so, for example, those are community-based um, violence prevention, which we've talked about in the context of Representative Fraser's bill, um, wraparound services for at-risk youth, um, and, and behavioral health interventions for kids that will need it the most. Um, so that bill is something I'm really excited about. Um, and in addition, uh, Representative Her introduced House File 4624, um, which had a lot of kind of different approaches to the similar issues, um, including um, some really great provisions, looking at supporting families where children are in an out of home placement to ensure that as they um, transition back to the home that those families have support um, and know how best to support those kids as they get back on the right track. Um, so, so those were the ones that I just wanted to mention and, and also just echo um, that the dual status and crossover youth uh, provision that is in the governor's budget is just um, a great um, proposal to really support the kids and protect public safety through investments in juvenile justice. Um, so I'll leave it at that, but I'm, I'm excited by the conversations we've been having and look forward to seeing those investments um, in, in the budget as you're considering the budget moving forward. Very well. Appreciate your work on this, Representative Feist. Um, well, um, so we'll turn uh, now to Representative Mueller. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Representative Pinto. Um, you know, as an as educator for almost 20 years, it's, uh, you know, it's obvious that mental health is incredibly important, and we know how much uh, we see with our, I mean, I know from my experiences in my classroom, um, how important it is for us to address these. You can't teach when a student is struggling. Um, and so I, I understand that. I did have some specific questions to this bill, however. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I serve on uh, both education committees and if I remember right, Rep. Pinto, I believe you're on at least one of them. I think, no, maybe not, I can't I remember. I, I believe, I actually believe Representative Feist may be on both education. No, Feist is on. I just couldn't remember I've seen your face around there too. <laughs> We've done so many things. That we have so many, uh, you know, similar uh, passions that, it, it, you know, we talk often. So, um, but I did want to ask, first of all, um, this has a set, uh, um, a, an appropriation or several provisions in here that's going to mental health for youth where it says that uh, for I'm looking on subdivision two, where it talks about uh, treatment and counseling provided at schools, subdivision three, after school programming. Um, I just wanted to know how that works, knowing that uh, the education committees, as I, I've, I serve on both of them, I have not seen this bill come through there. And so um, just kind of questioning if this bill is gonna be coming before our committees, knowing that we also have uh, initiatives that are coming, that we are proposing as well at the education committees uh, to address this. Sure, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much, Representative Mueller. Um, I feel like the the aim here, and I'll, I'll turn in just a second to Ms. Rickman, um, who, who again really helped um, along with a, a network of, of experts in this area and pulling this together. But I feel like the aim really is because this is going through um, through public safety and through the Office of Justice programs is that we really are talking about um, more aimed at system involved youth, I believe, and I'll have Ms. Rickman talk about that. So in that way, it really is, I would argue and think much more in our jurisdiction that even though, so yes, it's after school, there are schools, this is happening after school, that's really the connection as opposed to being directly with um, with school programs. But maybe the first, Ms. Rickman can just talk a little more about the um, that part of it, about kind of the intended audience or recipients of this of this programming. Ms. Rickman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representatives. Yes, I, I would echo what, what Representative Pinto said. The, the vision was that this would allow um, community-based agencies and uh, and or corrections uh, people, staff working with the youth who is justice involved that um, to provide for the services that they need within the either within the community and calling it after school programming I think was just simply to ind indicate that it doesn't it doesn't have to be provided within the school building or as part of that educational environment but has but there's this education component when you look at things like the mentoring and tutoring but those it was envisioned that that would be provided for example, through a community-based agency, the YMCA or something like that, that where the tutoring would happen there, the counseling would happen in a community-based agency and, and probably be arranged through the services provided through probation. That the, 
the connection with probation and the community-based services. Mm -hmm. Representative Mueller. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, um, Representative Pinto and um, Ms. Rickman. Um, I understand that this is what the intended audience is, and I understand how you know that you want to use community-based services, and that's really that's really uh, laudable. I'm just wondering, though, as I've been sitting in many of the committee hearings for uh, for education, isn't it still under the 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 educate or schools jurisdiction jurisdiction to not only uh, you know contract out with them or administer the money or, or I'm I'm just trying to make sure that we're not trying to advocate any of their of what MDE might might be having to do with any administrating of these grants. Ms. Rickman, or or maybe I can, Mr. Chair, sorry, I can address uh, that. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, so um, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, and Representative Mueller. Um, I think it's, although, you know, schools, so there's the word schools in here and then after school programming, but I really do think that, um, I think there's Rickman sort of helped amplify that for us, right? We're talking about grants that are going to organizations working in the community. They may, in some cases, be in, uh, have a, you know, connection with something that's happening to school, but I, I don't think that, um, uh, except for the fact that we're talking about young people who are of school age, you know, that necessarily that there's a, a connection with, with schools in particular, if that, if that helps. Representative Mueller. Thank you so much, Chair. And, um, and so I'll just make one final comment on this and then just go to my, my quick, my, my last question or comment here. And, and, and I hear, and that's great. I, I would love to see more community-based, uh, you know, more local control, being able to use the community services that we have. Um, I just know that many of the bills that we've heard and that we've heard in education, even if it says after school that's being provided by something not connected to the school, has gone through education and has had to gone through MDE or, or, you know, even the people who are providing it, sometimes Pelsby gets involved in it. So I, I, I don't, I'm not going to try to assume that you know, that this needs to go to MDE. I'm just trying to make sure that we've covered all of our bases. And then the, the, the last thing that I would say is, um, you know, one of the things that Ms. Richter said was, um, sorry, let me just look at my notes real quickly, is she talked about um, uh, screening, mental health screening. And I know that Representative Christensen uh, also po proposed a bill in education that would give mental health screening for K-12 students. Um, and some of that was, um, we, ha we kind of vetted a bill through that, and I'd have to go back and look at that, but we kind of vetted through it, and there was some, there was some issues with some of that because of the fact that we didn't know what to do with the data, we didn't know how we were going to make sure an opt-in, opt-out for the parents, and so I would encourage you as you're looking at mental health screenings, especially if those are being done at school, that we are, that we're, you know, consulting not only with MDE, but we're consulting with the schools. And I would also, I guess I would go and talk to Representative Christensen and see what she's been doing with her bill as well. Thank you, Chair Marianne. Oh, very well. Uh, Ms. Rickman, any thoughts on, on that? Only to reiterate that the this ask was for specifically juvenile justice involved youth um, to allow those working within the with that youth within the system within the juvenile justice system to do a better job of providing services that are targeted to that child's needs. Um, and I think we all too often assume that an assessment that is done in the school setting is an assessment that the folks in the juvenile justice system will first of all have access to and, and be able to use in the same way. And when, when you're screening for different reasons or for different purposes, it, it really is a whole different assessment process. And so, I, I would hope and that this assessment could be used to provide the services needed to the child and that that would also inform whatever educational needs the child has, but this was specifically targeted for those involved in the juvenile justice population for their special needs. I, I kind of heard uh, Representative Mueller um, asking about how we handle data um, uh, in that, and so I, I think it was. I think her comments were more, were less about the school, you know, "quote unquote" school purpose, and more about, you know, are we doing anything with the data in terms of these mental health screenings that, uh, you, you know, that you uh, that these proposals are conscious of, you know, et cetera. Um, so I, I don't know if there's anything there that you might want to add, or maybe that's a 
question for the bill author. Um, looks like Ms. Rickman was ahead unmuted, so she may have some briefly to okay. make sure if, where I can hear. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll just note, Mr. Chair, um, it, uh, uh, that's a good point, and, and I, I, I want to note anyway, I really appreciate it, Representative Mueller kind of highlighting where I think some of the wording of the bill may cause it to seem a little misleading, some of the references to school or after school. So I think if this were to move forward, that's really a helpful observation because I think we can tighten the language up a bit. I do think it's a different setting. And of course, if you have a young person who's passing through the juvenile justice system, the data and all that's going to be different. So we'll, um, these are really good points to highlight and I'll make sure to look at them as, as, uh, as, the, as this possibly would move forward. So thank you. Appreciate it. Representative Otney. Thanks, Chair Mariani. And, uh, Representative Pinto, I, I think the concept of, of the bill is good. Um, and as I've expressed to the chair in the past, concern that there's a continual shifting of money from public safety when it appears that all, you know, out of $8 million here, we have only 400 designated to go to um, children in the, in the detention centers. The rest appears to be more, as uh, Representative Mueller pointed out, you know, it's school related. Um, but my, that was my comment. My question is going to be for the chair. Uh, will this be going to HHS? I do not remember seeing that. So. Uh, our, our motion is to uh, lay this over. Uh, you can certainly inquire of the author of the bill about um, HHS uh, issues or perhaps make your case uh, if you believe that that's necessary. Well, thank you, Chair, because it just, as I said, it seems, um, although they're designated to be questions of, you know, uh, mental health services and um, things like that. So that would be my question to the author then. Yeah. Um, Chair Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for being Vani and you and I are both on human services, of course, um, together. Uh, and I guess, uh, so no, I, I would not think that it would need to, to go to that committee. This is a grant that comes out of, proposed to come out of OJP um, for youth justice services. Um, I'll probably, this will probably be a, a longer term sparring that you and I and others can have, but, um, but boy, if you have a young person who has, who's having um, significant mental health um, issues uh, that's um, uh, that may or may not end up having an impact. I'll just say, why don't we maybe I'll flip it around? When, when young people are, are mentally well, that's going to help them um, in all kinds of ways. And I've seen, I'm sure Ms. Rickman has, well, actually far more than I have, um, the impact that this funding has on public safety, on community safety. Um, and so I don't, um, these are, this is directly uh, involved, directed for young people involved in the juvenile justice system. That's the intended audience. Maybe a bit of language cleanup we need to do to make that super clear, but that's the audience. So both the, where the money flows and the target is all within this committee's jurisdiction, um, uh, I would argue. Representative Thank you, Chair Mariani. That'll be all. Yeah, thank and you. Too. Chair, may I just yes, please, say one thing? Please. Um, and with respect to um, Representative Matavi's comment about seeming like these are not as focused on youth who are in the deeper end, I would I would note that specifically in the mental health services for youth provision under subdivision two, it provides for youth in residential care. And that terminology includes youth who are in placement for uh, oh. delinquency behaviors that are significant, serious. And, and I would say from my own experience, that's a critical need for those, for the youth who are offending in very serious ways. Um, we see that deterioration <laughs> happen when they are in the community, but when they, be, when they are in a residential placement, and get the care and treatment that they need, they get stabilized. And then to be able to provide a continuum of care for those services when they are, um, when they leave the, the residential placement and are in the community, that's also something that's critical because we don't want youth decompensating when they return to the community from a residential placement. And those residential placements, as I said, include corrections placements. Very well. Uh, Lee, Lee Johnson. Uh, Chair Mariani, <clears throat> Representative Pinto, I understand this uh, bill. I, I think it's a good idea, but I do believe it needs more committee stops. 
Um, you talked about education and in line 1.11 to through 1.12, it says end treatment or counseling provided at schools. If they're going to provide at school, school's going to have to come up with, if not, they won't get the grant, the full grant, they're going to have to come up with funding to provide the uh, treatment and counseling providers at the school. Um, so I think it's something, and what type of treatment is the school going to allow? What kind of counseling is the school going to be able to provide? These are issues that uh, definitely need to be discussed in the education committee. And also on lines in subdivision three, 1.16, 1. Uh, 1. uh, grants to establish or support after school programming, mentoring and tutoring. A lot, most of the tutoring is done through the schools. Uh, there again, it needs to go to education. Also in one subdivision four, in lines uh, 1.2. 20 through 1.22 this absolutely needs to go to human services because it has to de develop an assessment tool for juvenile for the juvenile justice and mental health systems that include a continuum of care a model of care model specifically designed for the juvenile justice population um H or human services needs to develop. Although I thought we, uh, a couple of years ago, we already developed a program, so I'm not sure why we need to spend dollars again, because we had a pro we passed a couple of years ago a, a cultural specific uh, <clears throat> uh, care continuum for this type of issue. Also in uh, 2.2, um, again, needs to go to eight, uh, human services because there's dollars to provide comprehensive facility-wide training on mental health crisis response and trauma-informed care at this at the uh, juvenile justice or detention facilities. There again, we need HHS to develop or human services develop the response and how to respond and also not just for uh, mental health crisis but also for trauma-informed care. Um, so th this bill does need to go to both those committees to be, be looked at and uh, discussed. Um, so I'd recommend we get them to those committees as soon as possible. Sure, thank, Mr. You. thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative uh, Johnson. Uh, so a couple things. Uh, uh, so I will check with, uh, I'll check in with the Human Services um, uh, chair and, and, and staff just to be sure that we're, we're in good shape there. I do think that um, there may be a little bit of an artful drafting as I referenced with um, Representative Mueller regarding the, the references to schools. Um, I guess I would uh, uh, strongly disagree with you about that last subdivision about um, juvenile detention facilities, which I think are squarely within our committee's jurisdiction and the training that goes on there. Um, I will just note regarding subdivision four, you referenced the um, continuum of care assessment. And if you or anybody else has further information on that, I'd certainly love to hear more about that. If you think that there's some kind of overlap, this bill is being, overlap, being uh, laid over today. Um, and we'd be eager to hear about that. Um, this bill, the purpose here is to focus on young people in the juvenile justice system. That is squarely within this committee's jurisdiction. Um, the grant is proposed to be spent through Office of Justice programs. Um, and uh, certainly if this were to come back through our bill, um, want to make sure that um, we'll have the, the language be clear on that. Um, but I will check. I appreciate the advice too, though. So I'll, I'll do some checking in. Um, so I'll be able to report back to you all if this does move forward. But thanks, Representative Johnson. Appreciate it. Lee Johnson. Oh, okay. All right. I don't see any other. Uh, well, I do. Representative Raleigh. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I've got a question for the author. And uh, this, this uh, Representative Pinto, this is meant as a, a very friendly question. Trust me, it is. Um, 1.13. Um, uh, let me read 1.12 and then I'll read it all the way to 1.3. Funds must be used to support programs designed by those with experience as youth in need. Did you mean to use the word with, or did you mean to use the word as? Because my reading of it, if it, if it says as, then you must have been a youth 
that needed mental health services, mental health uh, was a mental health provider, and you were a correctional professional. If you use the word with, it would be somebody that has the experience with them. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Bromley. So, um, th so the purpose there is that the design of the programs should draw upon the direct expertise of people with lived experience. So mm -hmm. we're talking about youth with that experience. So uh, if you're asking about whether we want to hear directly from youth or from people who work with youth, we certainly want to hear from the latter group, but we also want to hear from the former group as well. Um, I should note that that phrase, like corrections professionals at the end, isn't meant to, to modify the rest. We don't have a young person who who has also served as a corrections professional right. <laughs> You're from multiple, multiple perspectives, including youth with lived experience. Representative. Yeah. And, and Mr. Chair, the reason I'm asking again is I, and my intention is to be friendly on this one. Um, my reading of it is if we leave it with the word as the intent of the author, I don't think is, is as clear as the ex example that uh, Representative Pinto just used, he said what we're looking for is those with the experience. And I think that proves the point. So I would suggest that the word as gets changed to the word with. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative Raleigh, something for you to consider then uh, Chair Pinto. Indeed, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Raleigh, for that. I'll give it some, some thought. Maybe uh, you, can, you and I can connect for a bit of wordsmithing together. So, Sounds good. I don't see any other um, I don't see any other uh, hands up, um, and so um, uh, Representative Pinto, why don't you close this out, and then we'll uh, move to lay this over. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks for the discussion, members. I'm so grateful to Ms. Uh, Rickman for her for her work. And I guess I'll just really urge members: uh, there is uh, a big need. We have young people um, who have been experiencing a lot of trauma for years and certainly for the last couple of years. Um, we know that there are concerns um, about, uh, about youth crime and what our youth are, have experienced. And so um, this is these are a few ideas. I direct you to please, uh, let's have conversations over the next week. I know Representative Feist um, is examining a lot of this as well. So make sure that we have a strong budget bill that can, uh, can take real action in this area. And thank you so much, Mr. Chair, for your support of this. Appreciate it. Very well, thank you for your work. Uh, thank you, Representative Feist. And uh, for the members, uh, it sounds like there's an open invitation from the author here to continue to work uh, with him. Uh, with your thoughts of of, uh, of making a good bill better, I'm not hearing arguments that you've got the the, the um, you know bad policy here, uh, Chair Pinto. Just you know more questions about you know uh, you know jurisdiction and those kind of things. But you're feeling uh, pretty confident that we've got the appropriate scope of jurisdiction here. Uh, but the policy seems uh, quite sound. And um, uh, Ms. Rickman, thank you uh, for uh, your testimony today and also for your your um, um, many years of really good work uh, at Ramsey County. Greatly appreciate that. Uh, with that, then, uh, the chair will uh, lay over House File 4397 for possible inclusion in this committee's omnibus bill. Uh, members, next we have uh, House File 4026, Representative Long, and Representative Long moves at 4026 be referred to the Committee on State Government. Representative Long, your bill is before us. We actually heard this earlier, um, and so we have laid it over. Uh, so obviously the chair is taking it off, uh, you know, bringing it back forward and uh, recognizing your motion here. And Representative Long, you do have a DE3. Do you wish to act on that at this point? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move the DE3, please. Okay, very well. Uh, Lee Johnson, okay with a voice vote on this DE? That'd be fine. All right, very well. Uh, all in favor of adopting the DE3 amendment, please say aye. 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 Paul, same sign. Motion prevails. And House File 4026, as amended, is before us. Uh, Representative Long. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, since our previous hearing on this bill, Senator Howe and I have had many hours of stakeholder meetings working towards agreement. There continues to be widespread support for prevention efforts as well as for the state helping cover the local benefit costs for uh, PTSD disability claims. There is also general agreement that we need to do better at treating PTSD for struggling public safety workers and at creating pathways to return to work whenever possible. I've been listening closely to feedback and this draft makes several noticeable changes. Uh, Mr. Chair, I know you wanna focus on the provisions our committee has jurisdiction over today 
um, the wellness training provisions in Section 7. These have had minimal changes since we heard the bill last, but I thought it would be helpful to give the committee an overview of the other changes uh, in the bill for the benefit of the committee uh, as well. Um, first, the bill would move out of the workers' compensation context and into the pension system. I heard very clearly in the previous hearing and in subsequent conversations that there are concerns uh, with moving forward in the workers' compensation system due to its adversarial nature. While I remain open to the workers' compensation approach in the spirit of compromise, I'm proposing uh, a new option today. We would keep the same uh, framework, same core concept from the previous bill, which is the 32 weeks of treatment. Uh, this is, to be clear, a new benefit that would be paid for by the state. We heard in our previous hearing concern that this status, uh, while a public safety worker was getting um, mental health treatment, may not be covering all benefits. So we made very clear in this draft that there would be full continuation of wages and benefits while individuals are, are getting this uh, treatment. Several very, very helpful suggestions have also come in uh, from my conversations with the firefighters, and I wanna thank them for their willingness to engage in dialogue on this. I know they won't be supporting the bill yet today, but I wanted to mention several changes that the bill has made at their request. Um, in our discussions, MPFF President Scott Badness mentioned a concern that there are firefighters who have completed PTSD treatment, but are not being taken back by their employers. And this is a concern I share. So this draft addresses that by um, requiring that if uh, an individual has gone through treatment and been cleared by their mental health provider, that they would be presumed fit for duty and their employer must take the employee back. President Badness also asked that we make clear that individuals should be able to return to work early or continue in light duty work at the approval of their health provider. And this draft incorporates those suggestions as well. Uh, and another good suggestion uh, from President Badness was to allow for additional treatment at the end of the 32 weeks if warranted, and this is reflected in the bill. So if at the end of treatment, uh, PERA or MSRS would make a determination based on the medical professional's report about whether the individual would benefit from additional weeks of treatment, whether they could return to work or whether they should proceed with disability status. Um, I'll just... Uh, Sum up, Mr. Chair, and note that I, I want to continue to work uh, with all stakeholders to reach agreement. I don't presume that this is the final draft of the bill. Uh, Senator Howe and I know have uh, much work to do uh, to continue on this bill. I'm sure the Pension Commission, where this will be headed, will have many good ideas as well for this draft. But uh, doing nothing this year is not an option. The current system is not working well for anyone, for employees or employers alike, and we need to work together to find solutions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair Long, and thank you for uh, a lot of work. Uh, you bit off a big issue here, uh, an important one, uh, and I just want to acknowledge the time and energy. Um, uh, we obviously had a hearing uh, on this uh, prior, um, and spent quite a bit of time, but we do have a number of testifiers uh, from the public, and so I, I want to uh, call on them at this point, uh, and then we'll do some uh, question and answer. Uh, members, I do want to make sure that uh, we have time to get to the uh, final bill, which we also have heard uh, before. Uh, and so on that one, I'll be um, moving to lay that over. And so we don't need to spend a ton of time on that bill, but I just want to make sure. Um, and so just a heads up for our testifiers that the chair will be um, looking to move um, uh, probably around 20 after two. So that gives us about 30 minutes here. Uh, for conversations. Uh, so uh, why don't we begin? Uh, and first we have uh, Edward Reynoso, uh, Director of, of uh, Political Legislative Affairs with our uh, very own Teamsters Local 320. Welcome, uh, Mr. Thank Reynoso. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Edward Reynoso. I'm the Political and Legislative Director for Teamsters Local 320. I'm here to testify in opposition to House File 4026. We represent, the Teamsters represent approximately 1,200 law enforcement licensed peace officers in the state of Minnesota. And this piece of legislation literally would be the only statute in law, if passed, that would prescribe a specific treatment for an injured worker. We don't believe this is a long-term benefit for workers or the employers. 
Uh, furthermore, you know, I, I want to give a, a few examples, and I know there's another testifier behind me that's going to touch on a few things. And uh, I, I want to point out uh, a few of the concerns that we have with this legislation. And I'll start off with uh, line number 2.30. It This is very vague, creates vagueness and obscure language that, that makes little to no sense. In line 2.3, it uh, actually starting on line 2.28 diagnosed with mental illness or diagnosed of mental illness means diagnosed by a licensed psychiatrist or psychologist and meeting the criteria for condition and conditions included in the most recent editions and quote DC 05 diagnostic classification of mental health and development or disorders of infancy and early childhood published by zero to three or Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorder published by the American Psychiatric Association. I, I, I just, for the sake of me, I don't understand why we would use the determining factors of this example for PTSD for law enforcement and first responders in general. Uh, secondly, on, on line 4.4, this opens up a worker's personal life by requiring them to disclose any previous so-called mental illness. What is the definition of a mental illness? Is it uh, taking um, anxiety medication? Is it, uh, there's, there's no definition of what that specifically would be. Uh, third and, and last, it specifically provides a prescription and plan for medical treatment by requiring 32 weeks of treatment. Uh, we feel this absolutely emphatically blurs the lines of treatment between the injured worker and their personal physician. We do, however, support few, a few of the provisions of this bill. Wellness training. It's something that we've been asking for for uh, a really long time, but we support it as an organization, but not on a yearly basis. It should be done as an as-needed as basis with professionals specifically trained in this field. Secondly, we support the funding for counties and cities. It's needed and we completely support it. You know, it's unfortunate that this bill will likely move forward today. Uh, we are willing to work with Representative Long to address the problems and see, that we see in this bill. You know, this, does, this bill also deserves a much more broad stakeholder input process. As a member of the WCAC, it took about three to four years for us to be able to pass with really in-depth conversation with all the stakeholders, not just a few hand-picked ones, uh, with all the stakeholders representing both labor and the business community, it took us three to four years to pass P the presumption of PTSD. This bill must have more, a more lengthy conversation before moving forward. Thank you for your, your time, Mr. Chair, and an opportunity to testify on this bill. Uh, and I'm willing to stand for questions. But at this moment, we just we just cannot support this bill moving forward for the concerns that I've listed. Thank you. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Reynoso. Thank you for um, your uh, thoughtful uh, testimony and for your uh, offer to uh, continually engage uh, with us as we shape good public policy. Um, next, we have uh, Mr. Brian Rice of the uh, Representative Minnesota Professional Firefighters Association. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Rice. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. My name is Brian Rice. I'm an attorney in Minneapolis. I'm here today speaking on behalf of the Minnesota Professional Firefighters. That's an organization that represents over 2,000 uh, unionized full-time firefighters and 46 locals throughout the state of Minnesota. Um, I'll echo a few comments that Mr. Reynoso made. There is agreement that in 1997, the state said that for any uh, injured worker who went out on a duty disability, the state would pay the health care costs. The state has not done that. The state has reneged on that. The state has not increased that appropriation for almost 25 years. And cities, uh, uh, I submit, a large reason they're coming forward on this is that they're having to pay a lot of money with the healthcare cost increased. The annual cost of that is about $6 million annually, an increase over about the 1.3 million you do. I think there's uniform agreement. The state should honor its commitment. Otherwise it's an unfunded mandate that's putting a lot of pressure on em employers. 
And that was a problem before we had the PTSD crisis that this bill is designed to uh, address. The second point where there is agreement is on the wellness issue. We uh, did engage for a, about a six month period before session, and we heard that wellness could help on this, uh, much like employee assistance programs helped on uh, people treating alcoholism. Um, there are some good models out there, like in the city of Plymouth, um, and that should be done, and that should be funded by your committee, uh, Mr. Chair. But as to the merits of the bill, um, I agree with what Mr. Reynoso has said. I don't know where the standard where you're going to use a diagnostic classification for mental health development disorders for infancy and early childhood with adult persons who are in law enforcement and uh, firefighting. Um, maybe somebody can explain that. That was not anything we considered. Um, I do agree. The biggest issue we see with this bill is this. This came as a PTSD bill. The testifiers at your last hearing talked about the dramatic increase in PTSD claims and how it was, quote unquote, unsustainable, bankrupting the system. The bill you have before you now, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, addresses mental health. That's a fundamental change on this. I mean, and it's all types of mental health. And from you know depression to anything you want to look at. And I, I don't understand why. I think it's a major, major flaw in this legislation. And that's why we are not supporting uh, this provision of the bill. We don't think it's ready at all uh, for prime time. That's in uh, 9.7, where the change went from PTSD to mental health. That's, I mean, it's stigmatizing everything about mental health. Um, it's just simply wrong. Um, that uh, uh, people would uh, do that. Another issue that we have, and I do think that uh, Representative Longs tried to work with us, it basically puts the director of the MSRS system and the director of PERA as the gatekeepers to determine who could go into this 30 week regimen of treatment. Now, I know Mr. Anderson, he's a very talented person. He has all the actuarial certifications you'd want, but I don't think an actuarial a person with actuarial certifications is the person to decide mental health issues. Um, I, I mean, and obviously they'll say, well, hire doctors, we'll do this, but that really puts the pension fund directors as the gatekeepers to this system. And that's not what's needed here, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, these mental health things are very challenging. Um, Many times before a person presents themselves, they've already been through treatment for a long period of time. They've been through stress. They're trying to manage it, and their cry for help usually comes after they've seen their own uh, psychologist, psychiatrist, after they've tried to work on it. And um, usually they, to, to enter this protocol, which we think has some merit, is going to be very hard, and then to open up all their mental health records, and that's what this bill does, going back to even childhood, potentially, is a very uh, uh, dangerous precedent, and quite frankly, we do not know. I'm a lawyer, I lobby, I, I practice in a few areas of law. I'm not a healthcare uh, lawyer. I wouldn't, I don't even pretend to know what it is, but I know that this does not um, make a lot of uh, sense at all. Um, Lastly, these it, it is a very contentious process. Uh, it, it does on looking at the para provisions on page 12 of the bill. Even if you clear the protocols, it still allows the employers to uh, rebut the presumption the person is eligible to go back to work with uh, substantial factors. And quite frankly, the employers, the, the firefighters have said that we have a firefighter now who went to an intensive uh, six week program out in Washington, DC in December, continued to treat with his physician, was clear to go back and the, the city refused to take him back because of their fitness for duty person. This person has burned through all of their, all of their part-time, I mean, PTO, sick leave, vacation leave, and they're sitting out being isolated, being stigmatized, and he'll be, he'll be lucky to go back to work in April if, if something else doesn't befall him. And so, there, there are things that need to be fixed, but with all due respect to Representative Long, this is not the fix that the legislature should advance. And it's an extremely complex matter. And it's just, um, we, we respectfully, we're, we're not in support of uh, this part of the bill at all. Thank you for your time. And then hang around for if there's any questions. Please do. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rice. It is indeed 
very complex. Um, next, we have um, uh, from the uh, uh, Chiefs of Police Association, uh, Chief Jeff uh, Potts. Chief, welcome to the committee. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, again, my name is Jeff Potts. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Chiefs Police Association. I'm here today speaking on behalf of the Minnesota Chiefs Association, who represents about 300 police chiefs across the state and another 150 command staff members. Uh, I'm also here representing the Minnesota Sheriff's Association, um, representing the 87 elective sheriffs in, in Minnesota. Uh, we would like to thank Representative Long for bringing this bill forward as we feel there is a need uh, for this type of legislation to be passed sooner than later. Uh, first, let me share just a little bit of data with you uh, to hopefully help you understand why we feel this way. According to PERA, uh, in 2019, there were 118 public safety duty disability applications. In 2020, that rose to 241 applications. In, 200, or in 2021, there were 307. Uh, more than 80% of these applications were for PTSD. And 93% of them came from law enforcement employees. The average age of those individuals seeking duty disability retirements was 42. This bill, uh, will help provide much needed resources to public safety agencies across the state. The bill's provisions for treatment, uh, frankly, are long overdue. Additionally, the requirements for wellness programs will go a long way to helping public safety professionals to better cope uh, with the trauma that they experience during their careers in law enforcement. But we do believe that this is something that needs to be addressed this session so we can slow the recent trend in public safety duty disabilities related to PTSD. We understand there are still more work that needs to be done in this bill, but I want to emphasize that I do think that there are things that can be done to reach agreement with the stakeholders on this bill. By passing the bill here today, we can continue to meet, discuss, and address those concerns. Mr. Chair, for the reasons I have covered here today, the M uh, MCPA and the MSA does support uh, House File uh, 4026, and thank you for your time here today and allowing me to testify. And thank you for your time, uh, Chief Potts. Um, and hopefully you can stick around as well for any questions. Absolutely. Uh, very well. Next, we have uh, Bradley uh, Peterson um, of the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. Welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, again, my name is Bradley Peterson. I'm with the firm of Flaherty and Hood here in St. Paul, representing the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities today. Uh, the CGMC represents over 100 cities outside of the seven county metro area. First, I want to thank the committee for taking up this issue, and I especially want to thank uh, Representative Long for his thoughtful leadership and engagement. Uh, public safety, mental health, the well-being of our public safety providers, and the needs of the public uh, is, to say the least, a sensitive and difficult mix of issues that can be hard to talk about, uh, but talk about them we must. Under normal circumstances, this is not an issue that CGMC would even be weighing in on. Uh, in general, we would defer to the League of Minnesota Cities on statewide issues such as this, unless there is some unique Greater Minnesota perspective to offer, or it is deemed so important to our member cities that it compels us to get involved, which leads me to my first point that I want to stress, that this is as much a Greater Minnesota issue as it is one for Minneapolis, St. Paul, or the metro suburbs. To put a finer point on it, uh, the need to retain re and recruit public safety employees and the cost of providing health care for employees on duty disability has become the most consistently raised issue at our membership meetings. The loss of public safety employees and their service, not to mention the long-term cost of duty disability claim requiring local governments to provide health insurance for those employees, have an outsized impact on small cities with small police and fire departments and small budgets. budgets out of which to pay long-term health insurance obligations for an employee who is no longer on the job. Having become more involved in this issue over the last couple of months, I've come to a couple of realizations about the current system. First, the status quo does little to address treatment for PTSD and other mental illnesses associated with an employee's service. Second, the status quo does little to help those employees who are able to return to work if possible after their treatment. Third, that the status quo is financially unsustainable for local governments across the state, especially in greater Minnesota. And fourth, ultimately the public is not well served by a system that fails to address the mental health needs of public safety employees, makes the public less safe because their police and fire departments are understaffed, 
and make their lives more expensive because of the increase in property taxes that will ultimately go to maintain what we have agreed is a broken system. As my letter to the committee on March 8th indicated, many of my members don't think the bill goes far enough to address the duty disability system. They would like to see reforms not only for PTSD and mental health, but for all claims. But if I've learned a fifth thing in the last couple of months, it is that at a minimum, the discussions around this bill and the issues it seeks to address need to continue. If we can address treatment and employees' potential reintegration into work and the state's financial commitment to supporting local governments as they support their employees, then we are only setting ourselves up for a harder conversation in the future. Again, thank you to Representative Long for his leadership. We look forward to continuing to work with him and other stakeholders. And to you, Mr. Chair, uh, for your committee's attention to this issue today. Thank you. Very well, thank you. A very important issue indeed. Uh, Mr. Peterson, it's good to hear the voices from, uh, uh, from Greater Minnesota on this. Uh, we also have uh, from the Association of Minnesota Counties, uh, Matt Hunger. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you very much for the time today and being able to present in front of this committee. Uh, my name is Matt Hilgart and I represent the Association of Minnesota Counties. The Association of Minnesota Counties represents all of Minnesota's 87 uh, county boards. I think Mr. Peterson did a fantastic job of outlining um, a lot of my comments as well. So I'll try to consolidate uh, Mr. Chair for the sake of time. Um, I think our interest in this and seeking solutions to this issue is really centered on three issues. As Mr. Peterson pointed out, the current trends and statistics are simply not sustainable, not only in terms of the financial costs, but frankly, the lack of options we have for recruitment as it stands right now. Senator Howe gave me an interesting stat for this hearing that the traditional state patrol uh, trooper class, the academy size is around 75, and right now they have less than 20 people in it. So with the sheer number of people departing, we do not have enough people to replace our current folks that are leaving. That leads me to the second um, issue, which is that for the folks, um, for the departments that are realizing losses in their department and folks leaving, it's putting an inordinate amount of stress on the folks who remain. Um, and that is significantly concerning to our sheriffs. And the third factor I think is the most important factor, which is the human factor. And that is that as you've heard today, we do not believe the current system places enough of an emphasis on mental health treatment. We had over 240 officers, deputies, patrollers leave last year because of PTSD, 240. And to me, that's an unacceptable number because as Senator Howe has said, that does not mean that you are broken. Um, and with proper treatment, we've heard from psychiatrists and psychologists from the EVA, return is possible. And frankly, that is the reason AMC is here. Our numbers are not as high as cities. Um, so to Mr. Bryce's point in terms of, you know, if we just gave them financial compensation for the health insurance piece, maybe that would satisfy needs. That's not our interest here. Our interest is for our future workforce and frankly, getting folks back to their communities, back to their departments if they can. And that's why I think that what Representative Long and Senator Howe are trying to do is so important and so pressing for our time being because the goal of this bill, zooming back out, is to put mental health first. It's not taking away the benefit of going to seek a para PTSD duty disability pension benefit. That's not taken away. It's not going through the workers' comp process. It's putting a pause and saying that if you need mental health treatment, if you're experiencing duress, we are going to support you. And that means we're going to pay for it. We're going to pay for your benefits. We're going to take care of you and your family during that time. And if you need more time, we're going to pay for that as well because we want you back. Members, I think this is a fantastic initiative. And I'm hopeful that all of the interested parties can continue talking about it because it is, is an issue that is not going to go away. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hilgart. Um, with that, th that's all the uh, testifiers I, I show. I also do uh, want to note that there are three uh, individuals who are uh, present with us uh, who are available uh, for questions in our conversation here. Uh, Kate Daly, uh, Ethan Landy, and Laura Zajac um, of the Department of Labor and Industry. Uh, why don't we begin uh, the conversation um, and we've probably got a good, oh, I don't know, uh, 15 minutes uh, for, for conversation. We'll begin with Representative Edelson, then we'll go to Representative O'Neill. Representative Edelson. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Wong. I, I mean, this is a heavy lift. I'm, I mean, and I, you know, just from the testimony I'm hearing, it, this should not be an either or. This is, it's not sustainable what's currently happening. And this isn't because uh, we don't support officers. It, and it, I think the public doesn't even know what's exactly happening right now. I have to be honest with you. Like, I, I don't think they have a clue. And I think what I would love to see is if you don't agree with the bill, offer different solutions. Because again, what is currently happening is not sustainable for the safety of our cities. It's not safe. It's not sustainable for the, the budgets. It's just not sustainable and healthy for officers. So I, and Representative Long, again, I just want to thank you. And I, I really, truly hope that you guys can all work together that we can, at the end of the day can have a solution here because it should not be picking sides. And um, and I'm disappointed when I hear that in, in testimony, uh, it, it seems like. Um, and Mr. Rice, I do hope that you're working with Representative Long with all of your concerns as well. Very well. Thank you, uh, Representative Edelson. Uh, Representative O'Neill and then Representative Bueller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just wondering if Representative Long would kind of talk about a little, little bit, when you change to para, what is, what is he envisioning? Um, the testimony was something about, well, they don't have psychologists and psychiatrists and therapists, and how are they going to evaluate? Um, Representative Long, could you just kind of give us a picture as to what is PARA going to do, and if you could help kind of fill in that gap for us? Uh, Chair Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, thank you for the question, Representative O'Neill. So we're keeping the same approach that we heard last time, which is a paid 32-week uh, benefit. But instead of them going to workers' comp to seek that benefit, this would be if they're going to seek a, a disability claim through the Paris system. So we we tried to put a um, a very low threshold for being able to get into that treatment, which is that uh, the individual would have one uh, doctor uh, diagnose, and then that would get them into the treatment, um, and then they would get paid 32 weeks of uh, benefit. They would get to choose uh, the individual, uh, you know, their healthcare provider who would provide that benefit. Um, and it's, if they wanted to go back to work early, because, uh, you know, in the example Mr. Rice gave of the um, firefighter who had six weeks of treatment and then was trying to go back to work, we, we uh, address that as well. So they would be able to, if their mental health provider said, yes, they're, they're able to go back to work, they would be able to do so. And we also made clear that that uh, is meant as fitness for duty so that um, employers couldn't interfere with that if they if they received treatment. So that's uh, in a sum what the what we're trying to achieve in terms of the process at the moment. Representative Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Representative Long. Uh, so just, just to clarify, what exactly is PARA going to do? The testimony was that they would have to be psychologists or psychiatrists or therapists or something to be able to make that determination whether or not they were they qualified whether or not they could go back to work can you just speak to that um i'm assuming that para doesn't have specialists like that um is is that what how are you that envisioning para doing this sure well. thank you representative o'neill yeah i think that's referring to the, the process at the end of the treatment when there is a determination about whether the individual would be able to return to work would be um able to uh, proceed with a disability uh, claim or if they require more treatment, if that's what their mental health professional has provided. And so we've um, had different approaches for how this might work. At one time, I was uh, had been proposing a, a mental health panel of professionals that would be appointed by the Board of Psychiatry and, um, and Board of Health. Uh, I got some feedback that that wasn't an approach people particularly liked. Uh, I still am open to that approach, but right now what we've have is para making that determination as they do right now uh, for whether an individual can proceed. And so they hire independent mental health experts uh, to do the review. And so that I think they would continue to rely on, on independent mental health experts that they uh, contract with. Representative O'Neill. Okay, thank you, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so the answer is they would just hire some experts, um, just like the courts do, right? So our judges have to make determinations all the time about someone's um, mental health ability to stand trial, for example. And our judges, as wonderful as they are, are not psychiatrists or psychologists, but what they do is they make they look at the totality of circumstances, they look at the report that comes in about their mental health status, they ask a lot of questions, and then they make a determination. So. I'm envisioning that para would do something like that, that they would look at reports, they would look at the progress, 
they would hire experts um, maybe to do an evaluation. And I think also, if I remember correctly, you said um, what's also important is understanding the nature of PTSD, which is it is something that carries with you for a very long time. And it's it's more of a managed thing than a cured thing. So it's uh, I, I am someone that has PTSD and it's something that you learn to live with and to get through. And uh, there's lots of techniques and, and strategies that you can use and implore. So I like the fact that if they need more, that that is also available. Uh, maybe last question, and it's really out of curiosity. Why did you pick 32 weeks? Sure, long. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative O'Neill. So we uh, consulted with the VA and we consulted with independent mental health uh, practitioners about what would be uh, essentially a full course of treatment for an initial PTSD treatment. And that was the consensus that we came to, but we also recognize that 32 weeks isn't a magic number. And so that's why we tried to address in the bill, the ability, if somebody receives um, uh, the, the go ahead from their mental health provider that they've been fully treated and can return to work, we're not requiring them to go all the way to 32 weeks. Um, and then if at the end of 32 weeks, they, uh, their mental health provider determines they need more time, then we would pay that for up to an additional eight weeks. And I just did want to note that uh, we have Para on too, if, if um, they wanted to respond to any of your questions, Representative O'Neill. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, if Para could just respond directly, that would be great. Maybe they could fill in the gap as to how they would do this. I'd, I'd ask uh, them to do that as briefly as possible. I still have a number of members. I want to make sure we get to Lee Johnson. And Lee Johnson, I may get to you first this time because I always leave you for the end and I wind up having to cut you off. And <laughs> I don't like doing that. Um, so is anyone here from Para? Uh, Chair Mariani, um, my name is Amy Strini. I'm the policy coordinator for Para. And uh, I'll be very brief. Um, Representative O'Neill, we use a third party in our disability process who does rely on experts to make these determinations. And then we review again, as you said, and the total of the circumstances when we are making our determinations. Representative O'Neill, you're good? I'm good, thank you. Very well. Uh, let me go to Lee Johnson, then I'll switch over to Representative Bueller. Uh, Chair Mariani, Representative Long, thanks for trying to tackle a very a uh, difficult issue. Uh, there's no one great answer for this. Uh, as somebody that uh, understands it, um, I have a individual that uh, comes to talk to me every once in a while. And just uh, don't know when he's going to show up. It was a little two-year-old I had to do a CPR on. Um, unfortunately, he didn't make it, and uh, he does, comes and talks to me every once in a while. That's uh, part of PTSD. Hmm. But each individual has to learn how to deal with it. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm not sure how accurate this is. It's a statistic that I, I read here about six months ago, but it, I believe it's pretty close. Each individual in their lifetime sees two, is involved in or sees two traumatic events. Law enforcement officers and fire personnel see about 807 in their lifetime. Um, so they see a lot of stuff. Uh, Representative Novotny and Representative Grossel and I have seen many things that we do our best to forget. But uh, we've seen a lot. There's a number of prosecuting and attorneys here that uh, seen the pictures of the stuff we saw in person. and I. And I understand some of them have trouble with it and have trouble looking at the photographs that we have to deal with in person while we take the photographs and do the investigation. Well, there's a couple concerns I have on this bill and it uh, almost needs to go to, I'm not sure if this, uh, if it's been to, uh, we've heard so many bills in judiciary, I can't remember because of the data practice with the mental health data that's gonna be looked at. Uh, making sure that that's uh, handled properly and that uh, falls up with medical data is, and a lot of this stuff would be covered under Chapter 13. We have to make sure that the uh, information is being handled properly. 
also they talked about the treatment and representative long stated that it's it is adjustable and that was a concern i had because each individual the treatment process is different some takes longer some might one or two sessions might be all it is and a lot of times law enforcement officer years ago we didn't have as much problem with this even though we had just so many incidents but we uh, post board and other co other individuals put on stress relief relief classes they don't as far as i can been able to tell looking at uh, the classes available that's not done anymore it gives it teaches the officers techniques and things to deal with the stress and deal with the situations that uh, they see and they have to deal with and i think it'd be a good thing to start if, making sure that these officers do get some training in how to deal with the stress and the trauma that they see i know one of the things that they always talked about in those classes and unfortunately a lot of departments have put uh, restrictions on it and that's allowing the officers to get together while they're working at their coffee breaks it gives them an opportunity to sit down and talk about what they've seen what they're feeling like and i've seen it where we've seen somebody having an issue and we've been able to get them the help they need before it goes goes over the line where it's a real difficult situation to cure because uh, just like uh, the, the uh, in the er they we sit down when we were able to sit down and talk whether it's the, am, uh, the, the law enforcement or the medical side of it, when they can sit down and talk and deal to deal with the stressful situation they've just seen or been involved in, it relieves the possibility of PTSD. It lowers the chance. But there again, we have situations where departments have put in policies where only there might be three officers working in the entire county, but only two can get together at a time to have coffee. And that third officer might need at that particular time he might need the one that needs to get stuff out to help him relieve the situation to prevent ptsd another concern i have in the bill is the light du duty issue yes it's great to get them back to work if they can but many small departments and most of our law enforcement departments are small in uh, greater minnesota most of our fire departments in fact across the state most of our fire departments are volunteer there is no light duty for them and these small departments i don't know where they're going to find 40 hours of work for light duty for an officer in a two or three man department they might find them something to do in the city administrator's office but even then finding 40 hours worth of work is very difficult to do um, so there's some issues there. Um, overall, I like the concept. I don't believe this is the right approach to take. I think this, they need to sit down and talk more before we put, finish putting this forward. This is on its way to ways and means, if I re remember, or no, state gov. State gov. But uh, we don't even have a fiscal note on this yet. Um, there's a lot of expense going involved in here and some of this funding, some of it's from the general fund. Some of it should be coming from a public safety budget because um, it deals with firefighters and law enforcement, which is public safety. Uh, <clears throat> before this uh, moves on, I would suggest that we get a fiscal note so we actually know what we're dealing with and the numbers and give uh, Representative Long more time to work out some of the details as brought up by some of the testifiers. There's some real issues with this bill right now. Um, and this is something we can't get wrong. The, the, the health of our police and firefighters is too great. If we do this wrong, we can actually do more harm to them than it's already happening. Um, Hopefully the riots and all that stuff was gone. That's where a lot of what I'm hearing a lot of the PTSD came from. Not all of it, but a lot of it um, because, of, because of some issues and we'll be dealing with them uh, on Thursday with that report. 
But at this time, I think it would be best, if, uh, Chair Mariani, if you just lay it over until we get some more information, and especially a fiscal note, so we know what the costs are going to be. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lee Johnson. It was a lot of uh, wisdom and good advice uh, that you're offering uh, the author and um, and the members here, and I, I do appreciate that. Um, I, I did lay this over earlier uh, to make sure we can buy some more time to answer some of these more complex questions. I know uh, Chair Vaughn has worked awfully hard uh, to do that, uh, but I am really fearful we lay this over now that it, it probably will uh, be the end of this bill giving our deadline. So my hope is that uh, we will um, you know, move forward and then continue to um, have the engagement uh, that you and others have called for. Um, I do want to apologize to Representative Botney and Hewitt. I, I am, the chair is going to move forward with a vote. Uh, because we're basically almost out of time, and I do want to do a, a procedural, uh, you know, um, getting the last bill up uh, before us because we only had an informational hearing on it uh, before. We don't need to do much, but I just want to make sure we do that. Uh, Chair Long, uh, 15 seconds here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I really appreciate the discussion. I just want to assure members that I uh, will continue to work, uh, Senator Howe and I, with all stakeholders going forward to try to get this right. All right. Thank you, sir. I want to thank all the testifiers here uh, today. Uh, a lot of passion, a lot of intellect, um, um, and a lot of goodwill. Um, and so I, I appreciate that. Uh, with that, uh, Chair Long uh, renews his, uh, uh, Representative Long renews his no, 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 no motion that House File 4026 as amended be referred to the Committee on State Government, and the clerk will take the roll. Chair Mariani? Aye. Chair Mariani, aye. Vice Chair Fraser? Aye. Vice Chair Frazier, aye. Lee Johnson? No. Lee Johnson, nay. Representative Edelson? Aye. Representative Edelson, aye. Representative Feist? Aye. Representative Feist, aye. Representative Grossel? No. Re Representative Grossel, nay. Representative Hollins? Aye. Representative Hollins, aye. Representative Hewitt? Aye. Representative he Hewitt, aye. Representative Cleavorn? Pass. Representative Cleavorn, abstain. Representative aye. Long, aye. Representative Long, aye. Representative Lucero, Lucero, no. Representative Lucero, nay. Representative Mueller, Mueller votes yes. Representative Mueller, aye. Representative Novotny, Novotny, no. Representative, Representative Novotny, nay. Representative O'Neill, O'Neill, aye. Representative O'Neill, aye. Representative Pinto, aye. Representative Pinto, aye. Representative Poston, no. Representative Poston, nay. Representative Raleigh, Raleigh, nay. Representative Raleigh, nay. Representative Vang, aye. Representative Vang, aye. Representative Shung, aye. Representative Shung, aye. Chair with 12 ayes, six nays, and one abstain. That concludes roll call. Very well. Uh, with 12 ayes, six nays, and one abstention, the motion prevails. And House File 4026, as amended, is referred to the Committee on State Government. Thank you again, Representative Long, and to all the testifiers here today. Members, really quickly, I misspoke on the minutes uh, earlier. Those were the minutes of March uh, 25th, not the 24th. My apologies. And so, uh, the clerk can make sure that uh, the minutes reflect, uh, you know, that um, uh, correction. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think I think we're fine. You know, we're just uh, re reflecting that that was the motion before us. Those were certainly the minutes that were before us. Uh, members, uh, the chair moves, uh, br brings forward House File 1369. Uh, it would be my intention to lay this over for possible inclusion. We had... Uh, a hearing on this um, a week or two ago, um, and uh, members, uh, um, unfortunately, I only had an informational hearing, so I want to make sure that we're doing things properly and getting this bill before us. I also want to make sure we amend it, um, and so uh, this bill is the one that establishes a task force in the collection of charging and related uh, data over uh, uh, the data on charging and prosecutorial charging. Uh, and then related uh, data uh, for that over at the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines uh, Commission. 
Um, I do want to move the DE4 uh, amendment. Um, and, uh, but as I do, I also want to acknowledge to Representative O'Neill, it was my intent to take you up on your recommendations um, that uh, we have legislators on this, uh, 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 on this uh, task force. Uh, I, I just simply neglected to incorporate it into what I had already had as a DE, but I, for the record, I just want you to know that it will be my intention uh, to do that. And I'd love to work with you in terms of trying to get that language uh, correctly. Uh, so I want to make sure I'm not, uh, the chair isn't ignoring its members here. Um, uh, chair, I'd rather lead. Uh, Johnson, uh, can we do a voice vote on the DE4? Yes, you can. Thank you very much. Uh, members, all in favor of adopting the DE4 amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion uh, prevails and House File 1369 um, uh, as amended. Uh, it is amended. Uh, and members, again, I don't need to, uh, I don't think I need to, and actually I don't have much time to do a whole lot. Uh, this does create uh, this task force to collect charging data. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, concerns from all sorts of, of folks about the fact that we don't have a statewide repository of data about charging decision. It raises questions around uh, possible uh, disparities, geographic racial disparities in charging. Uh, whether there's undercharging. There's been some concern uh, by members uh, of, of that possibility, uh, as well as overcharging. Um, and so this bill really says that um, uh, um, that without uh, data, it's really hard for us to develop the evidence-based policies and guidelines in order to make sure that there is indeed consistency, that there is fairness, and that there's always constantly promoting public safety. And so there's a task force that's created. It, it uh, lists out the members uh, of, of the task force. Uh, the DE4 was a product of uh, long conversations with the uh, County Attorneys uh, Association, um, making it possible for them to uh, provide uh, their support uh, for our effort. Um, the uh, task force will um, uh, do its work over a period of 18 months and bring back recommendations. Uh, for um, a long-term sustainable uh, collection of, of data on charging uh, by January 15th, 2024. There's a list of the questions that they'll be dealing with, things like determining what kind of data is currently created, um, you know, what are the factors that prosecutors make um, when it's making decisions to charge, um, you know, what, what, uh, what is law enforcement's current practices in terms of providing uh, data, uh, et cetera. Um, and so, uh, members, so we're not going to vote on this. I, I, uh, again, I just want to make sure we formally have it before, before us, and not just as an informational note, so that um, uh, when I move this, um, you know, for inclusion into our omnibus bill, uh, that we, uh, you know, uh, formally did that. Um, so with that, uh, Lee Johnson. Uh, Chair Mariani, just a couple of things on this uh, DE amendment that we didn't have an opportunity to talk about last time when we had it. Um, a couple of things. One, I, a task force isn't going to do the help. Uh, Representative Scott and Representative Novotny both had bills that would have started this process already going, um, getting the information out there to the public. Also, on uh, with the DE in lines 3.8 uh, 3.9 of, of this uh, DE amendment, I I do believe the Judiciary Com Committee uh, should have to hear this dealing with the uh, data piece and on those lines. Very well, uh, Lee Johnson, uh, duly noted. Uh, I'll be uh, checking with our Judiciary uh, Committee on on this. I believe we did, but I, I, I'll. I'll uh, double make sure uh, on that. Um, members, uh, we're, we're over time. And so uh, we'll continue this conversation um, when we bring this back up during our, our markup uh, period. And so the chair uh, lays over House File 1369 uh, as amended. Uh, members, uh, that concludes our business for today. Look forward to seeing you all in a couple of days. So until that time, uh, this committee stands adjourned.